process to begin processing them on, on them then. Um, I just saw a message about the broadcast is live. Were we live the whole time? Okay, I'm gonna continue as if we were. Um, so once you've got a way to receive the request, you then need a way to process the request. So we need some kind of compute engine. Oh, okay, we'd love 26 seconds. Uh, Justin, do you need me to start again? I can't hear you, Justin, if you are talking to me. Yeah, sorry, Gareth. I think we do, if you don't mind. Sorry about no, no that. Worries. All these gremlins. Oh. <laughs> Apologies. Hey, I have a demo to give, so I'm hoping that goes okay. All right. Hi, folks. My name is Gareth McComsky. Thanks for joining me. You caught me like in the middle of, a, of my third slide. Um, we're going to ratchet this right back to slide number one. Uh, what is serverless? Um, and uh, I was thanking Justin uh, when we went live earlier for allowing me to chat to you guys because I'm passionate about serverless. I love talking about serverless stuff. So I'm really happy to do this for folks who, are, who have questions about it or maybe not familiar with what it is and so on. Um, so yeah, let's 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 get into this and let's talk a bit more. And first of all, the obligatory hey Stephen, the obligatory who is this guy um, slide. My name is Gareth McComsky. I'm a customer success manager at uh, Serverless Inc., the creators of the Serverless framework. And those are my contact details. So if at any point now in the future, two months down the line, you need to ask questions about serverless stuff, feel free to hit me up. I love chatting to folks about it. Um, and a bit of my history, I mean, I've been building stuff for the web since the early 2000s and specifically building serverless applications since about 2016 um, from sort of the early days. Um, yeah. And in this talk, what I, what I like to do is when I'm introducing serverless uh, as a topic, I'd like to sort of set the scene in a bit of history as to what um, what a web application looks like, uh, especially in the backend context, because to be honest, serverless is primarily a, a, a tool to help you build backends. And even if all you do is build front end, uh, front end side of things, it's going to need a backend at some point. And finding really fast, efficient ways to do so can be incredibly helpful. And that's what I'm hoping to present today. But let's sort of set the scene a bit. Let's see what it is that serverless helps you solve. Um, and looking at what, what makes up a web application, you've obviously got the front end side of things. You've got something where users and clients need to uh, uh, start and make requests. So you have your clients making requests, whether they're browsers, applications, to a web server in the back end. There's going to have to be some web server somewhere or some thing in the back end to process requests. And that web server is going to want to chat to a database of some kind. You need to store data somewhere, so that's going to happen. That database has to talk back to the, uh, the web server as well. And then res responses go back to the clients that made the initial requests. And that's the very basic uh, sort of three tiers of a web application. And if we just go through this, like through bullet points, you have someone, uh, it, someone has to make a request in a web application. Um, and then you need a way to receive those requests. So if you have lots of someone's making requests, then you need a really good way to receive requests. And you need to process these requests when they come in. And again, if you have lots of people making requests and receiving those requests, you need a really good way to process this multitude of, of requests as well. Obviously, these, the, the processing is going to require storage and retrieval of data. So we need some, some good way to do that. And then we need to respond to that request as well, uh, per, hopefully through the same means that we received it in the first place. Uh, but that might differ. And this is really the structure of what it looks like for the web application that we need to consider. So let's take a look back in time. What sort of this web server backend thing would have been like uh, in the early days? And starting in the late 90s, uh, this is the age where everybody had to run their own data center. Running your own data, own data center still happens today, but it's far less required. Uh, back then, this was the only way really to get yourself on the web. Um, and eventually, over time, folks realized that this was a really big job to do. So a lot of uh, organizations and companies would start doing things like co-locating so that you could share power and network issues. So, if, you know, you, you manage the power network together with a bunch of servers instead of just one company servers. But no matter how you co-located these things, you as the owner of these servers still had to manage everything. And by that, I mean that you still had... Um, all the hardware to manage, everything, the rack space, it was your responsibility to manage all of that. It was a lot of hard work. 
Um, one of the downsides of this, this, this process was that there was always way more hardware available than needed. Um, if you can imagine the time frame it takes to order a, a, a very large server, get it into your offices, configure it, set it up, get things going, get it transported to a data center to get put in it, and so on and so on, this long process. By the time you finish that process, you're still ramping on users, and you could stick this machine into a data center only for it to be obsolete by the time uh, it's in there. Um, so you'd always over-provision, over-order, try to have far more harder than you would need sitting in a data center, which meant you might have stuff sitting there doing nothing. Most hardware would be sitting there idle and wasted. And back then as well, stuff went down all the time. Uh, this was sort of a new field. This was a new world. Uh, people, We were still learning how to do these things properly, how to build these redundancies in place. But things would still go down all the time. If you wanted to do this on the cheap, you, you would, you'd suffer some downtime. Uh, and that's just kind of the way it was back then. But over time, as the internet became more and more important to companies' bottom lines, there's a need for reliability increased. So now we move forward in time to try to solve these problems. And data centers are not fun. I mean, there's uh, some examples of some messy data centers. It's not, not a fun world to necessarily live in. So a lot of organizations don't necessarily want to deal with all of that. So coming into the 2000s, where we start seeing things start getting much more standardized in the web world, things start to become a lot cleaner to deal with. And virtual machines as a concept is born and we can start using these really awesome tools to help us manage our infrastructure a bit better. This also started seeing the introduction of things like AWS in the cloud with services like EC2, which EC2 is a very simple service to understand. It's literally just a machine that you can, you can work on remotely. It's just like having a regular machine. It's only, it is virtual, but it's just like having a regular machine to work on. So which is a really great tool uh, to be able to build infrastructure for a data center. But even though this helped alleviate some of those issues, there's still work to do here. This doesn't completely eliminate all the work that you needed to do to set up your infrastructure. You still had to install and maintain operating systems and applications on these virtual machines. Uh, that was still um, an amount of effort that needed to be uh, done. And architectural requirements for the infrastructure you needed still had to be managed and, and, and put together by yourself. So if you needed multiple machines all doing different things and communicating in different ways, that sort of architectural stuff you had to, still had to do yourself. Uh, but at this point, what happened now is at least we had hardware elasticity. So no longer was there that issue where you had to order a machine and wait weeks for delivery, wait days for installation into a data center, and then hope that you know it's still going to be relevant. You can turn on a machine right now and have it working within hours, uh, probably, uh, in your cluster if you needed to. So you've got this nice hardware elasticity, and that's what virtual machines gave us. And this is one of the reasons that the, the web, as we know, it's really sort of flourishing, is that if you needed... Uh, infrastructure somewhere you could get it up reasonably quickly at this point. And this is also where we see the beginnings of what we now call serverless because uh, the concept of serverless is that serverless isn't just about Lambda. Serverless is about managed services in general and I'm going to go into more detail about that. And this is where we start seeing services like S3 which is data storage that you don't have to manage yourself. There's no installation process. It's just a place to store uh, files and objects. SQS is a queue management service. You don't have to manage the actual infrastructure that runs your queue like a RabbitMQ. You just use SQS. So what does it actually look like to set up and manage infrastructure in the cloud uh, prior serverless? I mean, the alternative serverless is to not uh, it, it, what, what I kind of call server full. Um, so let's take a look at what that actually looks like. So the process you would normally begin by creating a new virtual machine instance in AWS. So you essentially go into the console and you click, you know, create new instance. <clears throat> you then need to uh, log into that new virtual machine you've created and uh, update all the software on it. You then need to know the right application software you need to run on it and then install that. Like you can use Apache for the web server. What about Nginx? What about MySQL, PHP? Any of the stuff that you might need on this, uh, this backend machine. You also need to configure the software. So you don't install it. Now you need to set up the configuration files, the, the sort of virtual machine interfaces in Apache and so on, PHP settings, you name it. There's, there's a fair amount of work to go through that as well. Testing this configuration to make sure it meets all the requirements that you have for your application. Then potentially configuring it for scale. So if you expect lots of users to come and go on, on your application that you're deploying, you need to figure out a way to help you manage scale on it. 
And you can't see that on the bottom because my thumbnail's in the way, but you then only then can you finally go and start installing your application onto these machines that you've spent all this time and effort working on. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, so yeah, uh, we've gone through all this process and only right then at the end have you finally installed your application that you need. But it doesn't end there because at this point you've still got maintenance to do. So you still need to make sure that you are, uh, are maintaining upgrades to the operating system. It doesn't stop there. Uh, operating systems are upgraded and updated. Security issues um, are found. Uh, because of these upgrades, you're going to need to plan for downtime and restarts to your clusters. So that's a bit of management there that you need to do that's outside of the actual development work. Uh, you've also got to manage upgrades to application software. The Apache PHP side of things also needs updates. And you need to be able to respond to new security threats. And you need to know about security threats. So you need to know how to keep your ear to the ground about them so that you can respond to them and manage your infrastructure to deal with that. And over time, as the volume of traffic that you're having changes um, and your needs for your application change, you're going to have to change your, the, the architecture of all, these, all this infrastructure you've set up to better manage load and the features you're, you're trying to push out. And managing load for, for a web application is not necessarily the simplest thing. And just to go through it very, very quickly, I mean, imagine you've got a whole bunch of users. Um, I, my drawing skills are not great, so you know, feel free to make fun of me. Uh, but you've got a bunch of users all trying to interact with your system that you've created. And from the front end, those requests are going to come into your architecture. And usually the way this is managed is that there is some kind of load balancer that will be set up between the users of your uh, uh, web application from their clients on the front end side to the back end using a load balancer. This load balancer sits in the middle and catches these requests. And its job is to help spread this load out amongst all of the web servers that you've got sitting in the back. So you might have, in this case, five copies of your application spread across five different machines, and the load balancer is just going to spread the load across all five of them. So this is a nice way to handle lots of load. And typically, you can set things up so that it can add a sixth, seventh, eighth over time. It detects that the load is increasing on these web servers, so it adds more, and the load balancer then spreads and so on. You know, you can set these things up. Again, it takes a bit of effort, but it's possible to manage this. You also then have a database that you need to speak to. And databases are a trickier beast, and this is a topic that you can speak to ad nauseum on uh, for hours on end. Um, but suffice it to say, a database is complex because it has a lot more involved in managing load for it. So managing load for a database, I'm just going to go very briefly through this. But one of the problems is that you usually need two for redundancy. So usually a configuration is set up where you have, a, you have two copies of your database, one that you write all your data to, one that you usually read your data from, so that you can kind of spread load between them. And they need to be set up in a way that when data is written to the one, it's replicated as fast as possible to the other one and so on. Um, the other side of it, of course, is if you have enough load, enough people trying to use replication, your CPU for your database machine can get overloaded and a bit too busy, especially in the relational database world. And usually the response to that is just give, make it a bigger machine. Just give it a bigger, beefier CPU to work on, which costs more money, obviously. Um, and the other downside of that is that when you're in beefing up the CPU on this database, it needs to sort of reinitialize that old database in the bigger, beefier CPU, which creates downtime. Might only be a couple of minutes, but when you're in the thick of things and have lots of people clamoring for your application, a couple of minutes is a big time uh, is, is a big deal. Um, and sharding is an alternative to this load issue, which I'm not going to go into massive detail on. But sharding is a very tricky, very difficult thing to manage, and affects your application itself. You normally need to write your application in a way to make use of sharding. So now, in order to accommodate load, you're making the developer's life harder, who now needs to deliberately code things to manage sharding. So that starts getting trickier to manage then. And this is all a hugely complex field. I mean, I've barely touched the surface here. And, and this is pretty much all unproductive work. At this point, all we are doing is trying to maintain the status quo, trying to keep things up and running to make sure that things don't fall over. We're not actually adding any new features, we're not adding value to our application and for our users. We're just making things continue to run. So. I've had folks come back to me with, well, isn't that easy? I mean, we have things like Stack Overflow and Google to use, don't we? Um, and I don't know how many of you have seen this, but Stack Overflow is a meme in the dev community for a reason. I'm sure we've all heard the jokes about copying and pasting from Stack Overflow. Uh, and it's a, stack, it's a meme for a reason. These things are not necessarily as simple as they sound. And while you might be able to find solutions that, uh, on Stack Overflow to patch in when you need, 
when you're in production, you don't really want to rely on your copy paste of something in Stack Overflow. You generally need experts to help you do this job, not just some guide on Google that you happen to stumble across. And the reality is that there is right now a very large shortage of these qualified DevOps professionals to help you run and manage all of this massive amounts of infrastructure for a backend that you might need. And these people cost money. If they're in short supply, they're going to cost you a lot of money. And again, as I mentioned, all that work that we've been doing, setting up, maintaining, managing, load balancing, is, is not income generating. We're not actually pushing features out at this point. We're just maintaining the status quo. So the reality as well is that requests have exploded in general on the internet. So we can't necessarily just say, oh, well, you know, mine's a, I've got a small thing that I want to put out. You know, it's not going to generate much traffic. Uh, that's, you really want that. And if you're pushing something out there that you want to put into production, you want the traffic. You want uh, stuff to come to you. And on the internet, requests have exploded. We've gone from just having regular old browsers, uh, which generated a moderate amount of traffic in the past, to the behemoths of uh, streaming that now generate absolutely gargantuan amounts of data on the web, um, and the app stores on your cell phones, you know, apps on phones also generate enormous quantities of data and massive amounts of requests. And we've seen this in graphs like this, looking at the total number of websites. This is one of the easiest to visualize graphs I've found, but this points out quite clearly that the internet has exploded in popularity uh, exponentially over the years. So we need ways to help build and manage systems that don't require us to spend a lot of time and effort managing and maintaining things we need to focus on being able to push out features uh, and get productive instead of maintaining infrastructure necessarily. So really the problems that we need to solve are that there's a lot more than desktop browser users out there these days. The incoming spikes into your application are far more common than before. All you need is that one reasonably popular guy on TikTok with a couple of million followers to mention your application and bang, suddenly, your, your app's going through the roof on traffic, your sales are skyrocketing, and you really want to make the most of this. And these things can happen in the, in the, in the modern internet. Um, and the traditional way to maintain this would have these big, massive machines sitting around idle just in case that maybe there's some, going to be some requests coming in. So you've got these big, massive machines just in case to, to catch these big spikes. Massive, huge databases to manage peak load just in case. Uh, even when nothing's happening, they still need to sit there ready and waiting, billing you by the hour. Uh, and you also need to be able to respond to a myriad of different types of clients. So it's not just the load itself. It's just all the different types of clients that you need to manage too. And all of this requires skills to manage this infrastructure, which, again, like I said, is in short supply. So is there a way for us to bypass needing these uh, a large number of people to build this infrastructure for us? And... Because the internet's so popular and because traffic gets so high on these things, competitiveness in, in the internet world is incredibly high. If you can't keep up with your competitors, um, they'll leave you behind while they you know, grab all the customers and you'll be left behind. So let me just take a sip of uh, juice here. So managed services is one of those things that can help us a lot. And this is kind of where we start talking about the serverless side of the world. One thing to bear in mind is these cloud vendors like AWS, even Google Cloud and Azure and all the others are not sort of sitting idly by watching all the money coming in on their EC2 and their very basic services that they launched at the start. They've been really busy. They've been constantly innovating and adding new stuff. So I mentioned S3 as a managed service previously, and S3 is essentially a massive disk. It's a place you can put stuff, whatever it is, JSON files, uh, images, video, you name it. You can just pile your files in there and it'll slurp it all up, no problem. There's no, no need to manage a disk space, no CPUs, nothing like that. It's just a really awesome, it's, it's, it's almost like having your own virtual machine with an enormous disk that you can use, except it doesn't bill you for a disk sitting there mostly empty. It only bills you for what you actually use, which is pretty cool. I've mentioned SQS. If you want a queue service to pass messaging around between uh, your backend, SQS exists. You don't have to go roll your own in a virtual machine. Uh, API Gateway and Lambda, which is something I'm going to be showing in a bit, uh, is, are two in, not, really great managed services you can use instead of load balancers uh, and virtual machines to help you receive HTTP requests and then make and, and process those HTTP requests. And DynamoDB is a really great alternative to a relational database, which doesn't ha have all the issues I've been talking about with databases with scale and, and, and so on. DynamoDB, API Gateway, Lambda, these three services I'm going to demo in a bit, 
but they all are managed services that you never need to worry about actually maintaining anything under the hood. And AWS manages all of them for you, which is great. They've got a whole bunch of people on their team that know exactly how to run these services, maintain them, secure them, keep them up to date, stuff you don't need to worry about. There's no setting up or maintenance for you to do. They just exist. You just start consuming them. Uh, they have all the qualified personnel, which is possibly partly why there's a shortage of them, because they're hiring them all, because they need them. But the whole world needs those people now. Uh, load is managed for you. So these managed services will manage the load. You don't need to worry about that either. And you get access to these services. Um, you can just start using them. Uh, but what AWS does, which is really clever it, to protect you and them, is that they will put certain hard limits on these things so that you can't overuse the service. Um, and what's nice about that is, is that if you make a mistake and just start consuming a lot of the service, it'll block you at some point so you don't you know, go too crazy and, 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 and get a huge bill. But also, it means that they can better manage their infrastructure in the back end. But they've got huge quantities of, of, of a huge amount of capacity to, to provide that. And most of these limits, you can go back to AWS and say, eh, you know, can you bump this limit up for us? And normally they go, sure, no problem. You go ahead and increase limits anywhere. And this is the last bill on managed services. A lot of the managed services that I'm going to be, that I've talked about and will be using are all built on usage, not on time, which is really awesome for load management because instead of having these enormously big, beefy machines sitting there at 2 a.m. in the morning, billing you by the hour when they're doing nothing, you only get billed on what's actually you're using. So if your app sits idle at 2 a.m. in the morning, it costs you nothing. The other side benefit of, the, of this is that running development versions is free. So if you're busy developing your application using these services, they often have free tiers that, as they sound, cost nothing, which is great because while you're developing and testing things in the cloud, you're actually paying nothing for developing on the managed services. And the scaling of these things is automated and always available. Again, you don't need to worry about actually scaling these things yourself. So to give you an indication of what I'm, what these limits are like, API Gateway as an example, which would receive HTTP requests from your front end, can handle about 10,000 requests per second per endpoint. And that's an enormous amount of data if you think about that. That's a huge number of potential requests. And you can bump that up if you really need to. AWS Lambda as well can do 3,000 parallel executions at the same time. That's like having 3,000 requests uh, uh, being processed simultaneously in parallel. And that's that's, that's beefier than any AMD Threadripper CPU out there. That's absolutely monstrous. And again, you can bump that up. And DynamoDB is an absolute beast of a database. It can do 40,000 writes or reads per second. Um, and that's before you even ask them to potentially scale that up for you as well. It's a pretty monstrous uh, database to use. All right, so and this is what a serverless architecture is kind of made up of. You make use of these existing managed services as much as possible. So instead of relying on these big machines sitting there all the time trying to configure things yourself, you try to use the managed services as much as possible instead to alleviate any of that hassle and worry. So you'll do something like set up API Gateway to receive those incoming HTTP requests. You use Lambda to process those HTTP requests. Use DynamoDB to manage the data from those requests. And API Gateway handles the responses as well for you. So that. That three-tiered uh, you know, request, process, store, uh, this is all managed with these, for example, these um, AWS services for you. And the other benefit of these managed services is that there are many of them. There are an absolute ton of them that you can use to help you build a really awesome distributed application. Um, so one of the things um, this means is that if your application goes to the next level and you need to really start building the hell out of it because it's becoming really successful, successful, you have this huge uh, world of managed services to look at to help make your application even better. So <clears throat> one way to do this is that if anybody has used AWS in the past, this might look a bit familiar. This is the AWS console. So if you create yourself an account on AWS, and you go to the API Gateway service, this is what this looks like. And maybe you want to go ahead and create a, uh, uh, an endpoint. Here you can see I've got the awesome endpoint. And you go and you configure this and set this up and make it a GET so you can receive GET requests. Okay, look. So let's just, we're building our application now through API Gateway. <clears throat> and then we want to handle requests coming to that endpoint. So we go to Lambda and we upload code into the Lambda service. Uh, this is our awesome dev hello Lambda function that we've set up. Um, and you can see it's connected to API Gateway there. So we had to go and add that trigger, set it up, connected to the API Gateway we created, set up all the right permissions to allow them to speak to each other and so on. 
pretty cool. Um, then we're in IAM here. This is the identity and access management service inside AWS to give permissions between your different services. So you have to go here and set all that up as well. Um, but this can get, this is a little bit hairy um, and has some problems. So what you can totally go and manually go and do all these things yourself in the AWS console. There are a few problems potentially with that approach. So one of the downsides is that it's kind of difficult to take what you just manually built in the AWS console and redeploy that somewhere else or redeploy it later or something like that. And what if you have other folks on your team that you want to work with and you kind of want to share this configuration that you've got set up? It's kind of difficult to share that. Um, and any changes you potentially make are kind of prone to error here because there's no sane checking. I mean, if you accidentally break one of your permissions or tweak an endpoint in the wrong way, you could bring a production application down. So kind of tricky. And even if you have a development environment that you test in first, are you really going to make the changes in exactly the right same way? Maybe you accidentally do something differently. Yeah, it's kind of hair raising. And there are services out there like CloudFormation and Terraform. CloudFormation is an AWS service as well where you can kind of like set up your infrastructure through code. Uh, but these are normally tools written for DevOps teams, so they're not necessarily built with a developer mindset in mind. So you can use these, but they can get a bit tricky because they look at everything from the, the actual services point of view instead of your application point of view. And that's where the serverless framework comes in. So the serverless framework and others like it. I mean, there are other frameworks out there to help you build serverless applications. So feel free to look at others if you want to. I'm going to speak about serverless framework, obviously, because it's the one I know best. Um, but the serverless framework exists to help help building this, help make building these things a bit easier. So first of all, it's a developer tool, and it's help to, it's designed to help you build applications using a serverless architecture. So already a very different mindset to those other tools that I uh, that I mentioned previously. It also allows you to configure everything you need for a service. So you don't need to go do anything in AWS. You can set things up. Uh, in your CLI without even necessarily understanding all the stuff that's happening in AWS, which can be a real benefit, especially when you're getting started with this stuff. It also is really great to help you do repeated deployments. So why this is a benefit is that you can do things like deploy this into a dev environment so that you and other people that you might be working with can go and test things and play with things. And then when you're happy, deploy it again into a production environment for your users and customers and so on or into your own AWS account while you're busy building things and playing around. It makes things a lot more flexible for you. You can share this with a team because ultimately it comes down to a serverless.jml file, which you'll see in a minute. Um, so it makes it very easy to share it with other people on your team. And that means that you can store this in a Git repository, which is great as a developer, so you've got some way to manage code and, and keep it stored over time. So as a front-end dev, though, why should you care about all the serverless back-end stuff? Well, First of all, there's in the in the backend world, there's a lot of hardware often to deal with. And hardware is difficult and you don't have to worry about it. Setting up, maintaining, and managing hardware is difficult. And there's a lot of intricacies to get to know and be familiar with if you're building backend sort of the traditional way. And we want to avoid that. Why should we have to know all of that nitty-gritty stuff? I want to abstract that stuff away. That's a solved problem. I don't need to have to worry about that. Operating systems is another big one. If you're going to spin up virtual machines with Linux operating systems, you now need to become a guru in Linux. You need to understand how they work. They want to put things together, install stuff, configure stuff. Again, this is a solved problem. Why should I need to know how all this stuff works? Maybe in the future. Maybe when I feel comfortable, I can go and delve a bit more into it. But right now, I want to build stuff. I want to generate revenue. I want to have value. SQL is a massive thing as well. If I'm going to be building backend tools, I need to interface with databases. I'm going to need to know how to build SQL queries. Maybe I don't want to have to do that. Maybe I can find alternatives to that that make life a bit easier. You need to worry about redundancy and reliability and how all that works. Again, solve problems. I don't want to have to deal with all of that. And then getting knee deep in service configuration, how they're managing all these things together, how they work. <clears throat> Again, if I don't need to do with that, I can build, build a front end. I can deploy a backend. I can connect the two with my HTTP requests. Let me do that as quickly and simply as possible. And if I really need to, I can get knee deep into the stuff later. All right, now, <clears throat> time for the scariest part of the, the talk for me. Um, demo, demo time. Let's hope the demo gremlins are kind to me. So I'm going to stop the screen share and just switch to the other, the other shares that I've got so we can take a quick look. Uh, just trying to find the right one to share. Uh, I think that's it. Yes. All right. 
Thank you, Justin. All righty. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go through um, a, a quick demo on how to how to build a, a very simple service. And I'm going to keep it simple, okay? Uh, I know there's more to it a lot of the time. And you probably, if you're going to build these things, you're probably going to spend a little bit of time uh, getting familiar with things and learning a couple of things, but still nice abstracted away from all the nitty-gritty details that I mentioned before. All right, so I've created myself a nice little folder here just to keep things collected. I called it FEDSA. And as you can see, this is an empty, empty folder. There's nothing in there um, except my IDE's configuration file. So if I'm wanting to start it with uh, a serverless uh, development first, well, the first thing I'm going to need to have is an AWS account. And that's just, you know, you just Google AWS console and go sign up for an AWS account. They will need credit card details to sign up for that account. But a lot of the stuff that I'm doing here costs nothing, really. Um, so you, it's not like you're going to get suddenly billed thousands of dollars or something crazy. Um, and anything you build with serverless, you can pull down immediately when you're done as well. So there's very little risk there. But be that as a mate, you need somewhere to actually put your application on the web and be available to receive requests. And AWS is the, one of the really, one of the most popular ways to do this, and especially in the serverless world. All right, so I've got my AWS account and um, I want to install the serverless framework and it's a node module. So I can just do npmi-g serverless. I'm going to install that uh, globally. I've already done that, so I'm not going to go through npm install. Um, but that's the way to get the serverless framework installed in your local machine. Really, really easy to do. And now I want to build myself a new service. Oop. So I'm going to just type serverless. And then it's going to ask me how I want to get started. So I can choose here, but what I'm going to pick is something to give me a little bit of a head up. I want to build an AST, uh, uh, um, uh, REST API. So I'm going to choose this HTT, HTTP API option. Uh, what do I want to call this project? I'm going to, I'm going to call it have this a theoretical customer service. So I'm going to have a service that is going to be managing my customer data for my front end. And now it's going to pull down the starter template for me. And it's created in the customer service folder. And now this setup is configuring, it's setting me up to my serverless account. Um, the serverless framework offers a monitoring um, dashboard um, that also helps me manage my connections to AWS as well as a bunch of other features. I'm not going to go into massive details for that, but just remember that you do have this available to you. It's a free SaaS tool. It's available to anybody if you're an uh, individual um, and low enough volume. Um, so feel free to make use of it like I do. Um, this is just asking me to choose which organization I want to associate when you project to so that it knows which AWS account to eventually deploy to. There are ways to manage connecting to AWS on your local machine without this. I'm just going to go ahead and pick one. So I'm going to pick that one. And then it's going to ask me for a, an app to save it to. And I believe I've got one here called FEDSA. All right. So now it's asking me if I want to deploy my project. And believe it or not, even the little bit that we've got now is actually deployable into AWS. Um, so I'm going to say yes to get that going while we go take a look at some of the files. Uh, because the first initial deployment can take a few minutes. So let's just get that done. All right. So I'm going to take a look here. I've got my files that this process is now generated for me to work with. And I'm going to take a look at the serverless.yaml file here. And the serverless.yaml file is sort of the central configuration file of a serverless framework service. And it's actually pretty easy to understand. Right now, there's some basics here you can see, like it's saying my provider that I'm using is AWS. I'm connecting to and deploying into AWS. I'm using the Node 12 runtime. Um, AWS has not yet upgraded to a higher version of Node than that, but it works great. I'm not going to complain. And we've also got a default uh, a function here that's been defined. And you can see this handler.js file is sitting here uh, as the default. What I want to do uh, for my custom service, and I'm just going to grab that so I can see what I've done previously. All right. I'm going to start by creating a, uh, a create endpoint. I want to have a post endpoint so that I can... Uh, create new um, customers in my service. So I'm going to change this handler name, rename that file to customer, uh, wait, my bad, to create. And then go into this file, I'm going to change the function name to create as well. And then in my service, in, in my service, the demo file, my file name is create.js and the function name is create. So now I'm pointing at my new file and my new function name. I also want this to be customer. <clears throat> so instead of just being the root of the endpoint, it's customer. And this 
is now, uh, all right. And I also wanna make this a post, yes, that's what I wanna do. I wanna make that post. And what's gonna happen is that I want this endpoint to speak to DynamoDB. So one of the one of the things to bear in mind is that we security is an issue when you're dealing with backend stuff. And we wanna try and um, keep security as good as we can. So one of the things we do with, a, one of the things that AWS gives you is something called IAM, and I briefly mentioned it before, which lets you set up permissions between different services. And I now need to give my Lambda functions permission to access DynamoDB where I'm going to store data. So I'm going to just copy something I've done before because it's a lot easier than typing it and it's a little bit quicker. And I believe we can hear the kitties. Um, yep, there they are. Um, and so here, all I've done is I've said I've got an IAM role statement where I'm allowing access to DynamoDB to put items into DynamoDB and to scan the database. And this uh, structure here is just defining the table itself. I could have just done this star, and that would apply to all DynamoDB tables. But if you can, you can make it more specific. So here, I'm only uh, talking to the one specific database table. And you might be wondering, which database table is that? So let me actually configure my database table. And I can actually configure a database table in my service at YAML file as well. There we go. So here I'm adding a resources block, and all this does is tell the service framework that I'm using what's called CloudFormation syntax. This is syntax that AWS understands to create me additional resources in my AWS account. So what I'm doing is here, I'm telling it I want to have an additional resource I want to create. I'm calling it, uh, well, that's a mistake. Let me change that to customer table. All right. That's, I'm creating a DynamoDB table. Here's the name of my, my, my table, and I'm naming it by giving it the service name that I've got, which is customer service, the name customer to differentiate the specific table and the stage I'm on. And I'll talk about the stage in, the, in a minute. And then I'm gonna use custom ID. So I'm keeping this very, very simple. DynamoDB is a very, very powerful database with lots of options. To use it just as a, as a, as a simple key value store is very, very simple to use, but it has far more options available to it than that. And you can go into massive amounts of detail if you really want to explore how to manage data in DynamoDB in a big way. All right. So I've got this set up. I've got my function pointing at the correct file. I've got all of that set up. Right, let me just change that. I might as well name it better. <clears throat> I've got my DynamoDB table set up here. And that should be good. So let's just go ahead and run another deploy. So I can now deploy again. And this time now, instead of setting things up, uh, now, oh, I need to go into my folder, uh, customer service. There we go, and now I can do a deploy. So let me just clear this so everybody can see. I did a CD into the right folder. Um, so let's deploy. And now it's just gonna take the changes that I've made and deploy that into my AWS account on top of the changes, the, the, the initial deploy that I did previously. And what's cool about this is I don't need to worry about how those changes are being made. The service framework is managing all of this for me. It's going to package the details that I've set up in this service.jml file that I've specified here and then build the correct configuration and file that's now being sent to AWS to update my infrastructure, create the new DynamoDB table, set up this IAM role statement, set up my function here, and so on. And I just, I just need to wait for it to finish. Um, while we wait for that to finish, I'm also going to start looking at my code. So let's start putting a bit of code in. Um, and one of the first things I'm gonna to need to do is actually uh, install a couple of packages. So I'm just going to npm i uh, AWS. I just want to see uh, AWS SDK and UUID. I'm going to install a couple of packages and <laughs> okay. So I've got those uh, packages installed and I'm now using them and uh, requiring them into my uh, create function there. Uh, just move this out the way a bit. Uh, and now I'm going to dump a whole bunch of code in here because typing this all out is too time consuming, but I'm gonna go through it, don't worry. We're all good. All right, so let's go back to the top here. So the first thing I wanna point out is you've got, this part is kind of important. This is what sets it apart from any regular other function you might have. You've got this module exports create function, which is async and there's an event parameter here. And often you can have a context one as well added to this if you need to. I'm not gonna bother with that for now. 
But this event object is what's important because what we have set up here is a HTTP API uh, with slash customer pointing at my code sitting in this file. Now, this is API Gateway. This is my configuration for API Gateway. And API Gateway is going to send data to my Lambda function, just like Apache is going to send data to your PHP backend if you do that kind of stuff. Um, you need some way to pass data from the, fr the, 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 web, the web server in the front that receives the request to the application software that's going to process the request. So here I'm sitting with this event object is containing all my data from API Gateway that was sent by the client, like create this new customer. And I'm going through here and I'm extracting the body out of that event object. So there's a body object containing my data that was submitted through the form. I am now just going to put this data into my DynamoDB table. Oh, and there's one thing I forgot to put in my service, the JAML. And you can see here, um, what AWS needs to know in order to put data into a table is what the table name is. And here it's using the environment variable called DynamoDB customer table, which we'll add in a second. And then it needs to know what that item is. So here we're creating a customer ID. We're using this UUID package to generate a random number. This is just a random number, just we have an ID, a random ID. That's all that is. We're then saying the body here has a name property and the and the email has an email. And that's what we're storing, custom ID, name, and email. Very, very simple. You can add more stuff. This is just a demo. And then we need to tell uh, AWS to put this data into DynamoDB. So we tell it, I want to talk to DynamoDB with this line. We say, use DynamoDB to put my data up here. and then return success once we've done that. Otherwise, if some problem happens, then it's going to throw an error out. And that's really the simple basics of it. That's a very simple way to receive data, put data into a table, and then send that out. So what we still need to just drop that information in. So in my service.jml file, I'm back at this configuration file here. I want to pass the table name to my Lambda function. So the way to do that is to add environment variables. And again, I'm going to copy this existing one that I've got here. Uh, oops, I need to copy this whole thing. So what I'm doing is I'm using this environment proper, property in my serverless.jml file to say, I want to add an environment variable to all my Lambda functions. I want to name it DynamoDB customer table. And this is the name of that table. You can see this is the same name that I put here. So this allows me to, this allows the Lambda functions to use environment variables to read data that I'm sending it. So this gets stored in AWS. Once again, let's just do a uh, deploy. Go to the right window. SLS deploy. And we're just going to deploy these changes. The only changes we've made is changes to our code and this environment for that we've added here. We've got our, our DynamoDB table still exists, and that's not going to change either. Fortunately, one of the things, these, these deployments that I'm doing, this serverless deploy command, takes a minute or two to process through the changes because that's what AWS is essentially managing the state of everything we're deploying, and it can take a bit of time. But if you want to run these kinds of things and test them in the cloud yourself, uh, sort of make a change to your code, deploy into the cloud, test in the cloud, make change, deploy a test, and so on, continue with that loop, there's another command we can use to make that quicker. But because we added this environment variable change, I can't do that in this case. I need to deploy this so that it can push out this new infrastructure change in quotes. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to set, start setting up a curl command here for ourselves. So let's do curl uh, dash x post. We want to make a request to this uh, endpoint. Uh, I believe it's dash dash data. Actually, I may even have one from previously. There we go. Um, I'm going to need to change this URL. But let's go look, what URL do we have here? Okay, so it has finished with that deployment. I'm gonna copy my URL and post that here. Let's just do that again. I'm trying to see what the error might have been for. You see this one, we've got a 500 error, so we've got something probably wrong in our code. Demo gods, they're at it again. And just really getting into C. All right, so if I, I need to take a look somewhere else quickly. Uh, actually, let's do uh, SLS logs. 
dash f my log name. So I can look at the logs of my function by going to that. So create. I'm trying to look for an error message. Uh, interesting. I've got a missing table name. Oh, my environment variable for some reason didn't want to copy through. Uh, you see there was an error putting item. So this caught our error for us, and now it's giving me the details of the error here. Missing table naming parameters. All right. So in interest of, interest of not taking uh, too much longer, because I think my time is about running out on the talk, this is just an error that I need to work through here. Uh, I've probably got something missing with my environment variable. Um, that's all right. I just have to work on that. But hope you guys can see the basics here. I can then go, and get, go ahead and after this, go and create my uh, get function. So I can then add a new endpoint in to get all my uh, endpoints. So make that customer, get all, get all. I can then add a new file, new file, call this get all.js. Um, start it off with the basics like this. And then start writing the code to retrieve uh, things from my DynamoDB table and deploy that. And that's it. I've now got two endpoints managed for me through API Gateway and Lambda. Um, so, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Just waiting for the shrieking to end. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to stop the screen share there um, and I hope you guys can see um, I just have a bug that I need to work through for some reason 500 doesn't matter how many times you try these things before and there's always going to be something that ends up going wrong at some point um, but thank you so much and I think we can uh, switch to questions now if you want Justin because I did think I see a couple yeah so there's a question from Stephen um, how do you know which variables can be used within the serverless YAML file is it by the serverless npm package docs or via AWS? <clears throat> okay, I'm, uh, my first question is which variables do you mean? So maybe I can quickly share again my uh, code here just to take a look at that, this one. Uh, I know. Okay, so if I look at the variables all here are defined by serverless itself, a lot of them. So here, for example, he has a variable called self-service, which is pointing at this service name. So a lot of the times I use this to help me name space stuff I, I might deploy into AWS because maybe I have another reason that I want a customer thing, but I don't want to conflict with this service that I'm building now if I happen to call something customer later because that's kind of generic. Um, this variable here, SLS stage. So the deployments you saw me making when I ran serverless deploy, by default was using a stage called dev. If I wanted to do a different stage like prod, I could pass a stage parameter into my deploy command to go to a prod stage or a Gareth stage or a Justin stage or any stage I need because maybe I just want to redeploy this thing I've built to test it, tweak it, change it before I deploy it into production. So, so you can manage multiple stages. Um, AWS account ID built into serverless framework just helps you a quick way to grab your AWS account ID and so on and so on. Um, there are other... Um, variables, and there's a whole page in the serverless framework docs at serverless.com slash docs. Um, and if you want the specific uh, page, feel free to hit me up um, and I can send that to you. Um, but the documentation for the serverless framework is pretty good in that way. And there's a whole page on variables and how to find them and which ones are available and so on. So ways to access stuff in AWS directly in your serverless.jml, et cetera, et cetera. Hope that helps. Um, I have a question slash comment, mm. maybe. Um, I think one of the fundamental things around service serverless is 
it changes the way we write code a lot, doesn't it? Um, and the way we approach infrastructure. Um, yes. As you mentioned up front, you're no longer maintaining these servers and services. And it can you can you just speak um, tell us a little bit more about um, this kind of on-demand idea that you're only using resources when they're required and how serverless helps you with that? Sure. Um, that's, that's kind of why I like going through a bit of the history. I know it seems like a long-winded way to get to the point sometimes, but we a lot of the times when you're building these things in the back end, it's, you're using, uh, it's been a lot of time and effort to have a big bulky machine with a CPU and RAM and disk space uh, that's going to process things on Apache and PHP or whatever the, your language your runtime of choice is. Um, and you have this singular machine with m hundreds of thousands of threads running in parallel, desperately fighting for resources and so on. And as an application developer, we always are, especially on the backend side, I mean, I've been building stuff in the backend for a few years as well. So what you end up having, in this, you're in the situation where you're busy building things on your local machine as a developer, and then you're kind of picking this thing up off, off your CPU, passing it on to a bunch of guys to, and asking them to put it on a different CPU over there. But they're fundamentally different because they're running different environments and hoping for the best that this all works out. Serverless so completely changes that. It, does, it says stop passing things over to somebody else to put out into production for you and make the developer in charge of what all that looks like because you're no longer dealing with a single machine where you have one, one funny little infinite loop somewhere that crashes thousands of people's experience. You have a Lambda function. And if that one Lambda function dies, who cares? That's one person's request. It's not affecting everybody else. You have far more resiliency and space to make mistakes as a developer and spin things up. If you realize that this brand new, lovely managed service in AWS is going to absolutely you know, improve your application in multitudes of ways, you can just go ahead and use it. You don't need to go know about the stuff, go ask somebody in the backend team. They yeah. need to create a server. They need to spin that up. You need to wait for them to do this. You're sitting around with your, you know, twiddling your thumbs. I was going to say something else, but I won't. Um, you know, it just wastes that time and effort. You can just go and do it as a developer. And if it doesn't work, well, just serverless remove. And I mean, if I can just, um, I've been d doing all this deployment and stuff, and if I just do serverless remove, it's all gone now. I've removed it. It's going to be out of my AWS account and gone. But I haven't lost it. It's still sitting here in my serverless, the Jumbo file. I can go serverless deploy it any time and put it back. Yeah, you that's know, incredible, so, actually. So that's you really know, useful. Yeah, you're not worrying about resources, costs, et cetera. Um, you can just put it up and pull it down whenever you like. That's a really fantastic feature, I think. And the other, the, the, the interesting part about this is you saw me make a couple of test HTTP requests, and yeah. I'm going to get built for just those two. But because API Gateway has a free tier of a couple of million, I'm not going to get built at all. You so never I'm building stuff that costs me nothing. Yeah. yeah, I've had customers who never, who never got built. I built them serverless applications, and they have thousands of users, and they never receive a bill because it never that's goes over the free tier limits. So yeah, that's incredible. Pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah, um, this might be a very uh, front end no developer not understanding <laughs> back end in any way. Um, but what's the difference? Would you say that serverless and containers of, are in direct competition with each other in a sense? Um, does does a serverless process have the potential to you know? make containers obsolete? I don't know if that's a really dumb question, because as I say, I'm a front-end developer. Um, but do, do you think there's, um, obviously, this, that one, there are advantages to weigh up in either category. But it seems to me like the ease of use of something like serverless functions over building your own containers and deploying them and maintaining them and all of that, mm -hmm. even though you're not building servers anymore, there's still a lot of ops work that needs to happen there. Um, do you think yes. that serverless is a is much easier thing to maintain than a, than a container-based system? And again, I I caveat with my front-end uh, <laughs> knowledge of these things being very shaky. <laughs> so my the short answer is yes. I I personally believe that serverless is ultimately, and I wouldn't say it's going to eliminate that because you still have virtual machines out there, you still have the cloud, you still have people running things in their own data center, and that's never going to change. The people will need that, and that'll They'll always be around. But the vast majority of people building stuff for the internet these days, 
I've worked with teams where, you know, in, 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 as, as, especially as a junior backend developer, you're so excited to get into all this tech. You want to spin up these machines and have the, all this stuff so you can play with it. And you go to your, go to the, you know, marketing manager and you tell him, I want, I want to build this. And they say, why? Why do you want to spend all this time and effort doing stuff that's not generating revenue for the company? We don't care about the toys you have. We want money. We need customers. We need to generate yeah. revenue. We need to get features out. We need to compete with people. We don't care about all the toys. Just get it done. And that's one of the advantages that serverless gives you, even if you decide in the future that serverless isn't quite enough for you. It has a lot of legs. It can get you really, really far. And we have companies doing billions of transactions a day using serverless. And that's not an exaggeration on my part. We run a monitoring service, so we know exactly what some of our customers are doing and the volumes that they're working at. And serverless can serve a huge uh, organization really, really well. A Canada is a really big one. They use uh, serverless as well. Um, but uh, Containers are a really great tool for the organizations and teams that need them and know how to use them. But that's really the problem, is that the skills out there are in massively short supply and cost a lot of money. And mm. if containers, and if serverless can solve your problem, use it. If it can't, well, then you should be moving on to considering the more complex uh, alternatives out there like container environments and virtual machine clusters. and All of the stuff that's there, it can do the job, but you just need more time, skills, and effort to do it. Yeah, yeah. You need you need a dedicated team um, to maintain that. While with serverless, and I might be wrong, um, you, you kind of you can put those resources to work in different ways. Yeah, on those people. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially in small teams. I mean, I've been yeah. part of small teams where I'm I'm the almost the sole developer, and it's my responsibility to build the infrastructure and deploy the application. I'd rather be building features than spinning up virtual machines. Um, yeah, so yeah, at exactly. the very least, this can get teams going up, getting started really, really quickly, getting stuff out there really quickly, and just testing stuff. If you're in the beginning stages of a business and you just want to try something out, well, serverless is kind of a low barrier to entry, zero, very low cost. And if things don't work out, you SLS remove and move on with your life. But if it does, you continue to scale. Um, mm. So yeah. very, very powerful. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you can, you can use you can use serviceless for components within your application rather than your entire application itself is am i am i on the wrong or right track there um yeah. could you have a standard kind of let's say um for want of a better thing a, you know dot net with a sql database where you are uh getting data blah 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 but then you've got a whole lot of static stuff static things perhaps on your on your site as well. Can you mix and match those kinds of things? Yeah, so what we find is folks often will build uh, serverless applications as a collection of serverless services. So almost a microservices uh, type of environment. So you yeah. saw me do yeah. a customer Sorry, that's, service. What I, that's the word I should have used, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. and there's the advantage this gives you, you can mix all these different technologies and the, the, the sort, of, um, sort of philosophy with serverless is use what works. Um, mm. You know, something that gets you up and started really quickly can often be replaced later when you have the time to, if it doesn't meet your, you know, your, your massive needs at some point. But get stuff out there, get stuff running, get stuff working, whether that's on AWS using API Gateway and Lambda or it's GCP using CloudRun or it's Azure Functions with whatever their data stores, I've forgotten the name, Cosmos DB, whatever it is. I mean, just yeah. go ahead and use those tools get stuff up and running, and you can definitely mix and match this. And ultimately, if you think about it from a front-end point of view as well, building a front-end these days, a lot of the times, it, and I'm sure you've heard the term Jamstack. I believe Fedza talks a lot about Jamstack. So, um, you do, yes. So that's really the, the cool thing about Jamstack is ultimately when you're building that front-end, the front-end doesn't care really how that stuff in the back-end works. As long as there's an endpoint yeah. to query, who yeah, cares? Exactly. And that's also the philosophy of serverless. Like why should the clients interacting with the backend, even care what the backend is doing. It shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Just get the backend up and running. Serverless helps you do that. And there's no maintenance. I've had, I've deployed apps six years ago, that, not six years ago, that's a bit long, five years ago that I haven't touched. And they're still running to this day on AWS. Wow. I, I'm, they haven't gone down. They're still going. Yeah. Um, and AWS, for to give them credit, is one of those old faithfuls where they have services that they no longer advertise or, or tell anybody about. But it's still up there running because there's at least two customers still using them. So they don't right. turn them off, but they don't advertise them. So you don't need to worry yeah. about something suddenly getting switched off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you might have with a certain other company we won't mention. Uh, <clears throat> um, well, that's great. 
Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, uh, I, just so if, if anyone wants to get going with serverless, they can just go to the website and follow the links and down and installation prompts. Is that correct? Uh, maybe I can just quickly drop that on the browser here as well. Let me share that. Uh, share screen. There we are. And is that the right one? I think that is. So if I go to serverless.com, um, there's a docs section here. So if I go to the docs, uh, the documentation, yeah, is pretty amazing. I go to, um, sorry, not user guides, the CLI references. Because we support multiple providers, you can go look through each of them. I suggest AWS, personally, just because they are the most mature and best supported. Um, and then I can go through all of this. I can go through the CLI commands and what they all do, the different events I can attach to my Lambda functions uh, in AWS. Um, the user guide, I find, is the best way to go. So I'm actually going right. to... Maybe drop that as a link in the chat if I can do that. Can I do that? Uh, no, I can't. You can't, but I can. <laughs> there we go. I've dropped uh, it for you in, the, in, our, in our little private chat. Maybe. Okay, share. I can drop that in the YouTube chat. Great. And from there, you can go through the intro, the quick start, and so on to help you sort of get up and running and, and playing with serverless stuff. Perfect. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Um, no more questions coming through. So, Gareth, I just want to thank you once again for your time and for being so accommodating with rescheduling. Um, yeah, of course. Um, we will. I'm sure we'd love to at some point do a much longer workshoppy type thing um, where people can get their hands dirty, so to speak. Um, but we can chat about that next year, <laughs> no longer this year. Uh, things okay. are, I think, um, a little bit past that. Um, right, so for those of you still are, um, who are still watching, please remember our next meetup, the 8th of December, we'll be announcing that. And this video will be available to re-watch once, once YouTube has processed it on our, our channel. So we'll, we'll share that everywhere as well. Um, and I'll, I'll pop you the link too, Gareth, if you want to uh, share with anyone. Great. Thank you again. And yeah, thanks, th thanks, for thanks so much. And sorry for all the shrieking children in the background. <laughs> No, but thank you. Adds, it adds humanity to the presentation. <laughs> what can you do? Yeah, yeah. Mommy, Great. mommy McComsky, keeping busy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks very much, um, Gareth, and thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, we'll see you again. Cheers. Cheers, guys.